Will you open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, to Acts chapter 10 and also to James chapter 2. Acts chapter 10 and James chapter 2. <clears throat> All 48 verses of Acts chapter 10 is the Holy Spirit recounting to us the experience that Cornelius had in hearing the gospel from Peter and how the Lord was working in Peter's heart to show Peter that God was no respecter of persons and how the Lord was working in Cornelius' heart to bring him to faith in Christ. And I've titled this message, No Respecter of Persons. That phrase is used twice in Acts chapter 10, referring to our God, that he does not take into consideration anything in and of us for the blessings of his grace and mercy. He is not a respecter of persons. You have your Bibles open to James chapter 2. Let's read a few verses from this passage first before we go to Acts 10. My brethren, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come in unto you, unto your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say to him, Sit thou here in a good place. And you say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourself, and are become judges of evil thoughts? <laughs> <clears throat> Scripture makes it clear that God respects nothing in us to determine whether or not to bless us with his mercy and with his grace. That's not true of men. Men are always respecting the persons of one another, taking into consideration a person's uh, position or their power or their um, personality or something or the other. They take respect of persons. The scriptures are clear that the Lord doesn't do that. And when we do it, we're only showing how much unlike him we are. <laughs> uh, and here's our encouragement. He's not like us at all. The natural man thought that God was altogether such a one as himself. And because he takes respect for one person over another, he assumes that God would do the same thing and attempts to present himself to God in a way that would earn him God's favor. <laughs> Isn't that what we do with one another? And the Lord says, no. This is the story in Acts chapter 10 of the Gentile by the name of Cornelius who was in Caesarea. Peter, the apostle, was in Joppa at the tanner's house named Simon. And you remember the Lord gave Peter a vision of those unclean animals that came down. And the Lord said to Peter, he said, take and eat. And Peter, like Peter was prone to do and like you and I are prone to do, foolishly responded to the Lord by saying, Not so, Lord. <laughs> Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unclean in my whole life. And you remember what the Lord said to Peter? Call not thou that unclean or common which I have made clean. And then the servants of, 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 um, of Cornelius come sent by God to get Peter. And when Peter realizes what the Lord is doing, Peter says to Cornelius, that Gentile, he said, I know now 
I know now, I didn't know it before, but I know now that God is no respecter of persons. Now, this is a great message of encouragement to us, brethren. Male or female, rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, powerless or penniless, <laughs> the Lord makes no distinctions to show forth his grace and his mercy. How many times we read in God's word, whosoever will. You know that whosoever, are you, let me ask you a question. Are you a whosoever? If you, are you a whosoever? You know, if the Lord had put my name in the Bible and said, Greg Elmquist, if you'll, I find more comfort in whosoever because I suspect there's been a whole bunch of Greg Elmquist in the world. And maybe that's not referring to me, but the whosoever is broad enough where I, I can fit into that one. <laughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our God is no respecter of persons. He's not like us. I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. You know, prejudice is a horrible thing under any circumstances. And Peter had a, a, a horrible prejudice in his heart towards Gentiles. And yet the Lord shows him here. Peter, I'm not like you. I'm not like you. My mercy and my grace is for whosoever, Jew or Gentile, black or white, rich or poor, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You see, you could be like the Apostle Paul who said concerning the law, I was blameless. He was outwardly moral man. No one could charge him with a with a. a, a a crime against the law of God. Or you could be like that cheat and liar by the name of Zacchaeus who was doing everything he could to take advantage of his neighbor to profit himself. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say to you this morning is that nothing you and I do or don't do matters in terms of our salvation. It's all of grace. You're not, going to, you're not going to earn God's favor like you would earn another man's favor by something that you do. <clears throat> you could be a king like David or you could be a, a poor crippled boy like Mephibosheth and the Lord showed mercy on them both, didn't he? You could be a a virtuous maid like Mary who bore the Lord Jesus. Or you could be like that woman at the well who had been married five times and was living in fornication at the time. God is not a respecter of persons. This is a message of encouragement to the sinner in knowing that, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to be saved, it'll be all of grace. It'll be all of grace, and it'll be all of God, and he get all the glory. <laughs> now, do these things matter in terms of our lives in this world? Yeah, they do. In terms of the benefit that we have one to the other? Yeah, they do. I'm talking about the salvation of our soul. I'm talking about the forgiveness of our sin talking about our relationship with God, and he says, I am not a respecter of persons. We could be a man of stature like Philemon, who ruled his house and had his church meet, or you could be like his runaway slave, Onesimus. You see, the contrast between the two made no difference. The Lord showed mercy upon them both. God says, I am not a respecter of persons. 
You have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 10. Let's begin reading in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A centurion was a commander of a hundred Roman soldiers. Um, Cornelius had achieved quite a position of influence and power and respect uh, in his profession. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, before we go any further, turn with me over to Acts chapter 11, because some have suggested that perhaps Cornelius, because of the way God describes him, was already a believer. But that cannot be the case. He had not heard the gospel. How can they, whosoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how can they call upon him in whom they've not believed, and how can they believe on him in whom they've not heard, and how can they hear without a preacher? The preaching of the gospel is absolutely necessary for the salvation of a sinner. Cornelius wasn't a believer. What the Bible says about Cornelius could be said of lots of outwardly moral men and women in this world who are religious and pray and, and, and make personal sacrifices for other people. But all of that earned him no favor with God. <laughs> look, at, uh, look at chapter 11 at verse, at verse 13. Now, Peter has gone back to Jerusalem and he's explaining to the apostles what the Lord had done for this Gentile by the name of Cornelius. And verse 13, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Well, Cornelius wasn't saved until he heard the gospel. And God attended the hearing of the gospel with the faith necessary to believe what he was hearing. That's when Cornelius was saved. Now, the Lord is not a respecter of persons. He didn't respect the fact that Cornelius was a man of, of great uh, piety and great fervency and great commitment and great virtue and neither did he take into consideration the fact that he was a gentile to cut him off as a dog as a gentile dog no no he sent him the gospel <clears throat> look at uh, chapter 10 at verse 25 and as Peter was coming in Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Would a believer do that? No. Peter rebuked him right away. He said, don't worship me. I'm a man just like you. You need to hear the gospel if you want to know who to worship. <laughs> now, it's clear from this story that the Lord had been giving Cornelius, what we refer to as prevenient grace. He had been, as he does with all of his children, grace before grace. And uh, it, it's not something that the Lord uh, rewards one for. And it's not speculative. The Lord doesn't, doesn't show a man prevenient grace in hopes that maybe it will result in saving grace. The Lord only shows his elect prevenient grace with the anticipation and the promise that it will result in saving grace. So the Lord had put on Cornelius' heart an interest in spiritual things. And, uh, and, and I reminded of what the Lord said to Daniel, but Daniel was praying for two weeks, asking the Lord to show mercy. 
And uh, when the Lord finally answered, the Lord said, Daniel, from the day that thou set thy heart to pray, I heard thee. <laughs> Two weeks ago, when you started praying, I, I heard you then. And I've been, I, you know, I've been letting you pray in my provenient grace to show you my mercy. Because there are some things you need to learn in the process of your prayers. And one thing that, one thing that Cornelius did not have, he did not have peace with God. He was working his way to heaven. He was doing everything that he was told by the Jewish religion that he had to do in order to earn favor with God. He was praying. He was giving alms. He was a, he was a man of great uh, virtue and great respect. He was the kind of man that you would want to have as your neighbor. And if the world was filled with more men like Nicodemus, it'd be a, it'd be a kinder and safer place. I mean, like, like Cornelius. But he lived in fear. He didn't have peace. I want you to notice the first thing that Peter says to him in, in, in um, chapter, 34, uh, chapter 10. We're still in chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. <laughs> I see that now. <laughs> I was respecting people. I was thinking that, that the gospel was only for the Jew. And, uh, but I see now that he's no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, who is it that fears God? What is it to fear God? It's to believe God. It's to believe God. It's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only true fear of God. What is it to work righteousness? It's to be found in Christ. So the Lord's not saying, you know, because you were a God-fearing man and because you were outwardly righteous, therefore I showed mercy upon you. No, he's just, that's contradictory. I'm not a respecter of persons. God shows mercy on those who are in Christ. <laughs> those who have been placed in Christ from the foundation of the world those who have brought, are brought to faith in Christ to fear God and to believe on God and to work righteousness, which is only in Christ. We have no righteousness outside of Christ. Look at verse 36. And here's proof that Cornelius did not have peace with God in all that he was doing like many of us who spent years in religion. And, and the more we did, the more doubts we had and the more fears we had. You see, God's elect are never satisfied with a works religion, a works free religion. The, the reprobate can be completely content in a free will works religion. And they can say, they can believe peace, peace when there is no peace. And they can make a covenant with death. And they can die holding on to that covenant. But God's elect will not. They will not. The Lord was dealing with, with Cornelius. He had no peace. And the first thing Peter says to him, after he speaks to him the truth, look at verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching Peace <laughs> by Jesus Christ. You want to have peace with God? Not going to have it except by the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It pleased God that in the Lord Jesus Christ shall all fullness dwell. All the fullness of righteousness, all the fullness of salvation, all the fullness of justification, everything that God requires, it's all in Christ. <laughs> all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Here's our hope. Please God. God's going, God's going to save a sinner. He's going to give Christ all the glory, isn't he? 
and the sinner's not going to be able to take any of it. Cornelius was one, one of those men that I'm sure his neighbors talked about him, his soldiers talked about him, and, and uh, he was a good man, as men go. But man, at his very best state, the scripture says, is altogether vanity. He's empty. Why? Because all the fullness of God is in Christ. <laughs> so man has nothing but emptiness left to himself. And all the things that his, that his friends and family members boasted in him about did not earn him favor with God. He had to hear the gospel. He had to be given faith to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To know that the only way, Cornelius, you can have peace with God is through the fullness that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> look, at, look at verse 20, Colossians chapter 1. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. That's it. You heard somebody say, have you made your peace with God? How are you going to make peace with God? What are you going to offer God? That's what Cornelius was doing. He was offering up God. His good behavior, his prayers, his righteousness in hopes of having peace with God. And if we don't have peace with God, nothing, nothing matters. How can a man be right with God? Through the blood of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only hope. And having made peace. He didn't offer peace. He made peace. God was doing business with God on Calvary's cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was not making himself an offering to us to be accepted or rejected. He was making himself an offering to the Father. And it pleased the Father that in him all fullness dwell. God was pleased. God saw the travail of his soul and God was satisfied. He was satisfied. And we have peace with God only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, look at the rest of this verse. By him, by him to reconcile. You see, there's the problem. You and I need to be reconciled to God. We are by nature, because of our sin, at enmity with God. We have to be reconciled. And by him, to be reconciled. He reconciled all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in the heavens. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works... You see, as good a man as, as, as Cornelius was, he fits the same category as those who stand in the day of judgment and say, but Lord, we did many wonderful works in thy name. And we've been praying all our lives and we've been doing this and doing that. And what's the Lord say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There's only one work that'll save a sinner soul. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I have finished the work, Father, which thou hast given me to do. And then on Calvary's cross, what did he say? It's finished. It's finished. The work of redemption is accomplished. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that precious, perfect, sinless blood has been shed. It's been put on the mercy seat. God is not a respecter of persons. God wasn't taking into consideration the, 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 the sacrifices that Cornelius was making and the goodness of his life. Now, had God given him provenient grace to seek them? When the scripture says that no man seeketh after God at any time, that doesn't mean that God can't make a man to seek after him. And if he does, that's God's work. <laughs> A man left to it, what the scripture means, that man left to himself will never seek after God. But will God do a work of prevenient grace, grace before grace, preparing one of his elect to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. Do you remember when Philip in John chapter 1 
found his brother Nathanael and said, we have found the Christ. (laughs) The one that's been prophesied all through the Old Testament. We found him, Jesus of Nazareth. And remember what Nathanael said? Nathanael said, what good can come out of Nazareth? (laughs) And Philip said, come and see. And when the Lord Jesus Christ saw Philip, I saw Nathanael, he said, an Israelite indeed within the, with whom there is no guile. And Nathanael said, how do you know me? And the Lord looked at him and said, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael immediately said, oh, rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the promised Christ. What do you suppose Nathaniel was doing under that tree? (laughs) He was praying, wasn't he? God had given him some grace before grace. God had, had set his heart just like he did for Daniel, just like he did for Cornelius, to pray. To seek the face of God. And did not reward him because he did but was preparing him to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what's happened with Cornelius. God is not not going to reward you because you prayed or did some good work. Does that mean that we don't pray? (laughs) We don't seek God? No. No. Our warrant to come to Christ is the command to come. That's our warrant. And God says, come. Knock. Keep knocking and the door will be opened. <laughs> Ask and to be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. So Philip had been given provenient grace. Sometimes provenient grace does not cause one to humbly seek the Lord. The best example of that is in the life of Saul of Tarsus. Saul was there when Stephen was being stoned. Saul heard everything that Stephen said. Saul saw his face like an angel looking up into heaven and saying, I see the Son of Man sitting, standing at the right hand of God. Saul watched him draw his last breath. What was the result of that experience that Saul had? Trying to justify himself. He was just became more fervent in promoting the law and tried to stamp out the message of the gospel. And that was all in God's provenient grace. Why? Because when the Lord arrested him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? (laughs) You see, through in God's provenient grace with Saul of Tarsus, he didn't become a humble prayer and seeker of God. He became more angry. But the Lord was pricking his conscience the whole time and bringing him to that place where he would arrest him. And Saul later in his testimony, Paul, the apostle later in his testimony said, those things which I did, which I thought were gain unto me, were actually to my loss. Or I've counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord that I might know him power of his resurrection the fellowship of his suffering nothing i nothing i did or didn't do our god saves by grace through faith and gives us peace with god only through the lord jesus christ that's the story of acts chapter 10 And the Lord will make sure that the gospel 
gets to those whom he's chosen. <laughs> the Lord was dealing with Peter and spoke with Peter there in Joppa and sent messengers down to Peter and Peter went back to, to Caesarea and Peter when he met Cornelius and heard the story about what, how Cornelius had seen an angel and the angel had sent messengers to Peter. Peter said, I see now that God is no respecter of persons. Even you can be saved. <laughs> Even I can be saved. Go back with me to Acts chapter 10. The word which God sent, verse 36, unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know, you know, we looked at Psalm 133 in the first hour. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You don't hear believers talk about making Jesus Lord of their life. Why? Because they believe he is and always has been. He's Lord over the living and the dead. He reigns sovereign over the armies of heaven and all the inhabitants of the earth. He's God. And we rejoice in that. We believe that. Do we understand how God could be made flesh and dwell among us? How he could bear our sins in his body on Calvary's cross? How he could suffer the full wrath of God's justice and satisfy the justice of God? Do we understand all of it? No. No. Do we believe it? Yeah. Do we speak contrary to it like the religious man does? No. No. We really don't understand anything we believe, do we? We, you know, we're talking about being prejudiced. The Jews were all prejudiced towards the Gentiles. I mean, prejudice like you, you and I probably never seen in our lives, the kind of prejudice they had. They saw it. They, wouldn't, they would travel miles out of the way to keep from going through Samaria. They were prejudiced towards the Samaritans, who were half Jews. The Gentiles were dogs. They were all just dogs, Gentile dogs. And you remember when the Lord called that Syrophoenician woman a dog? I'm sure that she had been offended by the Jewish people she had met all her life to be called with that racial slur, a Gentile dog. I mean, it just offended her and made her angry every time she heard it. And as soon as the Lord Jesus Christ called her a dog, what'd she say? What'd she say? Truth, Lord. <laughs> Truth, Lord. You see, that's what faith is responding to everything God says with truth, Lord. Only the Lord Jesus understood the full guilt and shame of sin when he bore it in his body on Calvary's cross. We believe we're sinners because God said so. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, they are nothing but sores and putrefying sores. And Lord, you said it. Truth, Lord. <laughs> truth Lord you see being a sinner doesn't mean that you bear the full weight and burden of your sin you couldn't bear that it means that when God calls you a dog you say truth Lord whatever you say whatever you say is right Believing that Jesus is the Son of God is not understanding the incarnation. How can we understand God being made flesh? How can we comprehend what that means? Or God dying on Calvary's cross? What? Well, we believe it. We believe it. Because God said so. Nicodemus believed 
what Peter preached to him. Look, look, at, uh, look at verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and with the Holy Ghost. There he is. He's that one. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one that that precious ointment was poured on his head and drips off the hem of his garment. And he's the Nazarite. You remember the Nazarite vow in the Old Testament? You remember Samson took a Nazarite vow? And uh, there, there, were, there were three things about that vow. And Samson couldn't cut his hair. And hair is a picture of, of glory, a crown of glory. And uh, he couldn't drink wine. And wine is a picture of, of the, the, the pleasantness and the joys of, of this life. And, and he, couldn't, he couldn't touch anything dead. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was that Nazarite. He's the anointed Nazarite who had his glory, his hair cut off, if you will, on Calvary's cross. And not only touched death, but became death. And though he had spent all of his life, you know, our Lord wasn't like us. He never, he never took a vacation. He never had to have he never had to, have to be entertained. <laughs> he didn't have to have the distractions that you and I have. Why? Because he derived all of his satisfaction from his father. He had perfect fellowship with his father every moment of his life. He was content with that. You and I can't do that, can we? Until he hung on Calvary's cross... Then the, the joy of that fellowship was broken as he was forsaken of God, became, becoming sin. And God made him sin who knew no sin. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. He, he fulfilled that vow on Calvary's cross. And here Peter is telling Cornelius, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God was with him, and he did nothing but good and he delivered those who were oppressed of the devil. And we are witnesses of all these, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. At one point, there were 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And from that day to today, the Lord Jesus Christ has never appeared to anyone other than his elect. Never. He doesn't have to convince someone who he is. <laughs> uh, you know, he doesn't have to to do anything to a reprobate. He just leaves the reprobate to himself. He just leaves him alone. But he appears to his people through the preaching of the gospel. And Peter makes it clear whom they slew. You see that in verse 39? Whom they slew and hanged on a tree. The scripture, the law, said cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. The Lord Jesus Christ was cursed, condemned for sin as they slew him and hung him on a tree. But look at the next verse. God raised him from the dead. <laughs> what is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ about? We're fixing to be in the Easter season. I talked to some people recently that were started their 
their practice of Lent to prepare themselves for Easter, thinking that God was a respecter of persons and he'll take into consideration the sacrifices that I'm making now for the next 40 days to prepare me uh, for Easter. <laughs> and it seems like everybody who names the name of Christ believes in the resurrection. They believe it as a historical event, but they have no understanding of what it means. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is this simple. It's God saying, I am completely, totally satisfied with what you've accomplished. He would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. He raised him from the dead as positive proof that in him all fullness dwelled. <laughs> his death was sufficient. God is a respecter of Christ. He's not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of Christ. He's looking to the Lord Jesus Christ and his perfect life of righteousness and his perfect death. Him God raised from the third day and showed him openly. Look at verse 41. Here's proof of what I just said. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. God's not trying to get a following. He's not, hey, his voice is not heard in the streets. He's not going around trying to, trying to convince people who he is. He makes his children willing in the day of his power. He gives them faith to believe everything that he says. Cornelius is listening to Peter preach the gospel. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, verse 42, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. The living and the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness and his life will stand as the plumb line for judgment. To him, look at verse, look at verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness. <laughs> Cornelius, you've been... Cornelius was a Jewish pros proselyte. He had a copy of the scriptures, I'm sure. He'd been studying the Bible and been learning about the prophets, but he didn't know. That to him give all the prophets witness. All of scripture speaks of him. It all points to him. That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. There it is. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. When that Philippian jailer was about to fall on his sword in fear that the, that the uh, prisoners had escaped. And Paul stops him. And the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say to him, well, you know, you just go back to your house and see if God will have mercy upon you. Just go back and, and pray and wait and see if you get a feeling, see if you get an experience. No. Paul said what the scripture says and what we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe. Rest. You say, well, doesn't the Bible say that the devils believe that there is one God and they tremble? That's not what it is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to rest all the hope of your salvation in him. It's to love him. It's to look to him. It's to rest in him. It's to embrace him. It's to believe on him. Cornelius had been resting the hope of his salvation without any true peace in his prayers, in his almsgiving, in his good works. God sent him a preacher to tell him 
God's not a respecter of persons. He respects Christ. <laughs> Believe on him. Rest your hope on him. And as soon as Cornelius heard that, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Spirit of God fell. You see that in the next verse? And gave him faith to believe. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Come to Christ. How do I come? Just like you are. <laughs> God's not a respecter of persons. Look to Christ, believe on Christ, rest in Christ, love Christ. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, speak to our hearts and reveal to us the fullness of your grace and glory in Christ. Cause us to believe on him, for we ask it in his name. One sixty eight. Let's stand together. One sixty eight.